Ahora continuamos con Laura Wilder. So we're going to continue with Laura Wilder, Executive Director of Idaho Barley, and she's going to speak about barley, supply and demand and procurement and provisioning of um, the barley. Um, she's the Executive Director of the Idaho Barley Commission. She's responsible for supervision, coordination, research of barley, also for market development, education, and programs. And this is all financed through the state tax of barley, which is a tax that producers themselves pay. Laura is from Idaho, and she's the fifth generation owner of her family uh, farm near Caldwell, Idaho. She graduated in science, agricultural journalism from Texas A&M. Laura has uh, served in different positions in the agricultural sector, for instance, executive director of the FFA in Idaho. She's also the executive director and um, project coordinator for the Meat Project of Idaho. She has also been the editor of Line Rider for the uh, Idaho Cattle Association, and she's also the executive director of the FFA. Mrs. Wilder is part of the advisory board of the dean of the Faculty of Sci Agricultural Sciences of the University of the Idaho, also part of the advisory committee of CALS, and she's also part of the advisory committee of the program agronomical program of barley of the University of Idaho. She's also the president of Go Red for Women of the American Heart Association, and she's also the president of the Franklin Ditch Company. Laura, welcome. Buenos dias. Good morning, everyone. Um, he covered a lot of my background. As you can see, I have a diverse background in agriculture. Um, I'm not a scientist, but I work closely with scientists and coordinate research in our state. And I've been involved in meat animal production my whole life, so I have um, kind of a broad, unique background in agriculture. I'm very excited to be here today to talk about barley, one of my favorite topics and something um, that has a lot to offer for the work that you do. We're going to do a brief overview of barley production, supply and demand, and evolving products. Barley production, um, we're going to talk about current production and the changes that we've seen um, over the years and what those dynamics look like. So uh, the 2020 numbers for world barley production, top 10, the EU is by far the largest barley producing region in the world. Um, second is Russia. Um, but you can see there's a huge difference between those two. 51.5 million metric tons for the EU, 21 million metric tons for Russia. The United States is down at number nine, and so uh, we are down a lot lower in current barley production with um, other countries in between. Australia, a major producer, Canada, Turkey, United Kingdom, Ukraine, those are all um, ahead of the US. Ukraine still managed to um, produce and uh, harvest a significant amount of barley in, in spite of the problems that they're having. What's really interesting is to look at 40 years ago in, in 1982, Canada and the US were at the top of this list, followed by um, a number of other countries, and you see Australia down at 10th. So what are some things that, that have happened during this time period that's really caused a shift in where barley production is? Um, and a lot of that has to do with what's happening in the US. Um, in the 70s and early 80s, there was a lot of research done as far as improving uh, meat animal quality. And um, at that time, corn showed that it was um, superior for putting down marbling, intramuscular fat, so there was a big shift in livestock feeds from uh, barley to corn during that time period. And so the U.S. geared up in a big way for corn. So it was said yesterday um, that corn is king in Iowa and in the U.S. Um, it's been repeated multiple times. Barley still has a lot to offer as a crop. It's high in protein and amino acids, and we're going to look at some of those other things. But corn is definitely superior when it comes to energy um, and um, efficiency and also laying down that uh, quality that we need for meat animals. Um, and here's just another graph that really illustrates 
where the world production of barley is right now. Um, these countries that are producing the largest quantity are more open market um, type uh, suppliers. The U.S. has gone to more of a specialty type market and almost all the barley from the U.S. is contracted either for malt, um, food barley, or feed barley. So who are the top barley exporters? How does that match up with production? Australia is actually a number one, followed by the EU. The EU uses a lot of barley um, within their countries for feed and also for malt. Um, Russia, Canada, Argentina, Ukraine. Um, you see the US is 11th for barley exporters on a global scale. Mexico is our number one market, and a lot of that is for malt production, and that's shipped by rail from the US to Mexico. Um, top barley importers, China. Who's the largest beer drinking country in the world? China. So there's a lot of um, interest for malt and also for livestock feed, followed by Saudi Arabia, Iran, European Union, and down the list. So global barley use is um, significant, though, even though production has decreased in the US. Overall, it's the fourth largest grain crop in the world after wheat, rice, and corn. 70% of barley globally is used for animal feed and fodder, 30% for malt, and um, then there is a other amount used for food barley. One of the most highly adapted cereal grains with production occurring in all types of climates all over the world. Um, barley is also culturally important because of beer, and um, that's another reason that you find barley produced everywhere. Barley in the U.S. is a little different as far as usage. About 70% of U.S. barley goes um, for malt production, with the remainder for livestock feed, followed by human food, and pet food is a growing market for barley. In fact, uh, currently 20 to 30% of barley produced in North Dakota and Minnesota is going into the pet food um, industry. So that is a rising trend that is taking away from other uses of barley in the U.S. So what is the current situation for U.S. barley? Um, I have both acres and hectares on the slide. Um, Last year, we had an 8% increase in barley acres, and that, um, that would be um, 2.9 million acres planted and 2.4 million acres harvested. So it's an 18% increase overall in the harvested amount. That's a pretty big change. So in 2021, I think you can all remember the pretty much nationwide drought we had that um, caused a lot of problem for barley production. And last year, even though we had a dry winter, we had a wet spring in all the barley growing areas and we were able to make up that difference. Here is the barley acreage map. And you saw the maps for corn and sorghum. So corn is mostly focused here, sorghum here. Barley, um, Idaho, Montana, and North Dakota produce 75 to 80% typically of the U.S. barley supply. Last year it was 82%. So three states are producing most of the barley. Barley loves cool wet springs, which we see there, and also high desert climate like we have in Idaho is ideal for growing barley. U.S. yield and total production increased 16% last year as far as yield and 31% in total bushels. That's an increase in acreage and also in yield. So when we had the drought in 2021, everyone was strapped for getting barley. Tight supplies, there was not enough globally. So there was a lot of making up to do in 2022. So, um, you're going to see continued acres and increases just because of the tight supplies caused by the drought, also the Ukraine situation. And um, these numbers should be strong going into 2023 as well. Three states, 82% of the 2022 barley crop. Idaho 
has less acres than Montana but higher yield because we have um, abundant irrigation water. We had a record yield of 111 bushels per acre. North Dakota um, came in second, growing 27% of the U.S. barley crop, and Montana uh, was third at just under 20%. So that gives you a pretty good idea of where barley production is. So globally, the supply and demand, we're going to look at um, 2021, 20, 22, and 23 marketing years. You can see uh, there was a pretty big drop from the 21 marketing year to 22, and that's the drought that we talked about. So if there's not production, there's no barley for use. As I mentioned, barley is more of a specialty crop now. Farmers grow barley when they have a specific market, whether it's malt or feed. So the usage is in more direct proportion to the production because of the way the crop is grown now. And you can see the big bounce back um, last year. Whoops, hit the wrong one. But not back up to the previous year. And even though the U.S. had huge increases, there were other areas of the world that had significant weather problems in addition to um, the acres lost in Ukraine. And this is um, a really important reminder to diversify suppliers and supplier locations to not put all your eggs in one basket per se because there will be climate problems ongoing. If the U.S. has a bad year, Hopefully, other countries that produce barley have not had the same kinds of problems. And so uh, you can see how much difference it can make in the market in just one year. So pricing for barley in today's market, um, the name of the game for U.S. barley is forward contracting. The countries that are producing huge volumes are more open market, but some contracting as well. Growers in the U.S. have a lot of choices for what they grow, and they're going to grow the crops that are most profitable, the highest return for them on the land that they have. And that may be corn, that may be soybeans. Those are two crops that have taken away barley acres because there's demand in those markets. So growers in the U.S. Um, forward contracts. So for the 2023 crop, they were contracting as early as August last summer, and early fall. So if you are looking to buy raw barley from the U.S., um, you should work with a supplier the fall before you actually have the harvest to secure the supply with forward contracting. And that's something, if you're interested in working with um, barley companies or barley growers, um, I'd be happy to give you more information on that. Um, it's a good practice because it guarantees that you're going to get the supply you need and also there are such differences in needs from maltsters to food barley, et cetera. Um, for protein specifications, um, maltsters are very specific in what they need, and so growers grow varieties that are going to meet the specs for the end use. The same for food barley. So um, if you have certain specs that you are looking for for barley, you can contract for that and um, secure your supply that way. But know that you need to contract a year in, in advance to be able to get the supply that you need. So it's often best to work with um, companies that um, buy from farmers and can uh, supply the needs that you have. Um, things that have affected pricing, um, we're seeing record prices right now. So um, the 2022 uh, average price reported by USDA was $7.30 a bushel, which is 1540-ish uh, hundred weight, which most barley is sold. Those are record prices for barley, and they were even higher than that in a lot of areas. Contracted prices, especially for malt barley, were higher, and even feed barley um, in our region because the tight supplies and the demand. Weather can have a huge impact on prices, and um, we talked about that a little bit um, already. Uh, so supply and demand, barley supplies are going to be tight for another couple of years while the world catches up to 2021. So expect barley prices to remain fairly high going into this uh, harvest year and probably another year as well. 
evolving products for barley. Um, there are some exciting things on the forefront. As I mentioned, um, barley lost a lot of market share to corn just because of some of the meat quality um, advantages that corn had. But there has been a lot of research done and a lot of work by um, universities and companies on different um, new products that you can use barley with. And I'm going to talk about some of the things that we're seeing and are happening with barley. Um, first of all, um, why barley? Why do we still want to consider it as an ingredient for feed? It um, is a grain with high energy, high protein, um, high amino acids. It's good for ruminants like cattle. It can be used for growing and finishing diets or blends or feed mixes, as well as pet food and aquaculture, and those are really the evolving markets. Barley is a carbo carbohydrate that provides fiber content, and it's highly digestible for pets. It also has one of the lowest glycemic indexes of all cereal grains. Um, barley, because of the low glycemic index, is helpful when manufacturing pet foods for diabetic or overweight dogs. And it's very satisfying, keeps hunger at bay. It's great for the digestive system. So those are things that are especially important in the pet food market. Um, so I'm going to talk about Emerge. It's a new barley protein concentrate by the Schooler Company. Schooler is a global company. Um, they have locations all around the world. But their barley team, their um, lead barley team is in Idaho. Um, in central Idaho, about two hours for, from where I'm at. And they have a novel protein ingredient that's a nutrient-dense and environmentally friendly um, protein concentrate called Emerge. It's um, sustainably grown, and it's exclusive by Schooler. It's a patented production uh, process. An innovative and consistent product, um, plus access to grower transparency, category expertise, and verifiable traceability all go along with the agricultural supply chain. And one thing about forward contracting, um, barley growers have been used to having to provide traceability information to the companies they contract with for um, quite a few years. And that's something in an open market that you don't always see. Um, it's hard to get growers to start doing the tracking, and that's pretty much happening with barley because everyone they contract with is already um, requiring that, and so there's good traceability with barley. And um, as mentioned, barley is inherently a non-GMO crop. There are no GMO varieties. So if you have um, buyers and markets that are looking for that characteristic in your feed, it, barley is definitely a good ingredient to look at. Um, so one thing about the Emerge product for aquaculture, it's been um, highly tested with both aquaculture and pet food markets. Um, it helps support and facilitate sustainable aquaculture pr practices, and it, it doesn't use any acids or solvents, which is fairly rare in this type of product. Um, so one of the commercial studies was 375,000 trout that went from juvenile stage through harvest. And the emerged trout had identical growth to trout that consumed a fish meal diet. The flesh color and taste showed no difference. And they also found the low phosphorus content and high digestibility supports cleaner water quality, which when we talk about sustainability, that's something that's important. So again, high Phosphorus bioavailability maintains healthy fish color and taste, supports cleaner water quality, low phytic acid content. So if you're looking for aquaculture ingredients, um, this is a product um, that should be on your radar. Um, as far as using this product for pet food, um, if pet owners are looking for clean label ingredients, Emerge is a product, again, that you might want to consider. Um, it delivers neutral flavor and natural color, no change in palatability, and it also has low phytic acid levels, which helps improve the protein digestibility and utilization. In trials, dogs chose this product formulation 
two to one over other vegetable and plant-based proteins. And again, if you're looking for a plant-based protein, um, this is something that's gonna be up and coming on the market. 85.4% um, dry matter digestibility, 88.9% protein digestibility, and 100% as palatable or more palatable compared to other high-performing um, pet foods. Um, it's a state-of-the-art facility. Um, it's located in Idaho. This is considered a pilot plant. This product will be produced globally in other locations. They're ramping up production. Um, this plant has been operational for not quite a year, um, and I've been able to be there at all the stages of construction and see all the progress and see things um, happening there, and we're very excited that this has so much to offer to the nutrition market. Um, it has all of the food safety certifications, and um, they can work with um, different suppliers and buyers on their individual needs. Um, one of the, the main co-product of the Emerge Barley Protein Concentrate is a barley syrup. Um, and this is a product that um, is a one-of-a-kind direct production from barley grain. Um, so it has less pro processing than other similar types of syrups made out of other grains, um, non-GMO, natural process, again, no acids or solvents, um, quantifiable sustainability traits. And um, again, when they contract with growers, they're able to really track um, production and where this comes from and manage that. The unique nutrition profile um, has a BRICS um, of 28 to 72, and it's high in C6 glucose, which are things um, that will make it a good additive for feed rations, um, and unique functional properties as an ingredient. So this is something that you'll be hearing about more in the near future. Um, I've actually tasted it. <laughs> I've tasted both of them, seen them at the plant, and um, it'll be interesting to see the applications that this will have for the broader um, animal, aquaculture, pet, nutrition landscape. Um, if you are interested in learning about these new products that are coming out of Idaho, but um, again, this is a global co company. Um, they have four... Um, Facilities in Mexico, um, that's their location and locations in Latin America at this time, but they are poised to grow and they are poised to work with um, interested parties all around the world. And if, if you come to Idaho and you want to go to the plant, it's two hours from my office, talk to me. I'd be happy to make introductions. Um, so... I am going to give you a recap of um, some of the barley highlights. And again, this is a very quick, broad overview just because of the time limitations that we have today. But if there's an area of the barley market, um, supply and demand, or if you'd like to know more about products, um, come see me and talk to me and I can uh, give you more details and information. Um, just uh, today we don't have the time to cover those. Barley is an important crop crop globally for livestock feed as well as products for pet food and aquaculture in addition to being used for um, malt and also um, human food. New barley products will bolster the use of barley in feed rations and products. So yes, barley's um, components are different than corn, they're different than sorghum, but it definitely has a lot to offer as an ingredient and maybe something that um, to consider as you are looking for uh, different rations and different applications. Most barley is contracted with growers in the U.S. in early fall for the next season. Barley purchasers should plan to purchase early to secure barley contracts and supply. Um, but that being said, there's the capacity to grow a lot more barley in the U.S. You can see historically that the U.S. has grown significantly more barley. The shift in acreage was due to higher demand for other crops and grower profitability growing those other crops. But if there's a market and the price is competitive, farmers will grow more barley. And 
as, um, as that need increases, there is the opportunity to make the shift. So you can expect, if you would like to use barley, you're going to be able to find it, um, but you might have to do a little planning. There are many companies that you can work with to secure uh, the type of barley that you need, and I would be happy to be a resource for you or put you in touch with the other barley growing areas in the U.S. if you're interested in getting more information about those areas. So um, we're down to the time that we have just a few minutes for questions. I would be happy to take any of your questions, or you can track me down at lunchtime. Any questions? Ninguna pregunta sobre la cebada? So we have no questions about barley. Hola. Out of my life to, of beer, I'm going to ask you something. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Eh, las variedades que se utilizan para... The different varieties that are used for different uh, purposes. Are there huge differences with regards to performance and features or characteristics with regards to the different uh, types? Uh, again, just out of curiosity, I'm asking that question. Okay. That's a very good question about the different types of varieties and their application for different purposes. Yes, there are significant differences in variety, um, in protein content, in beta-glucan fiber. Um, so for beer, you want protein in the right range. If you have drought conditions, sometimes um, all varieties might be higher in protein and that can cause problems for malting. But Normally, certain varieties are grown for malting. Uh, food barley varieties have more beta-glucans, which is not desirable for beer production. There's also hold barley and holus barley, which holus barley is great for food barley and maybe pet food or applications, but you want hold barley for beer production because of the holes for filtration and such. So yes, there are varieties that have different purposes and there are significant ranges. Um, there are some barley varieties that have beta-glucans over 30%, which is very high. Um, and there are others that are quite low. So depending on what your needs are, you need to talk to your supplier about getting specs. And that's why barley has gone to more of a specialty crop with contracting, because there is such a range, and growers need to know what their target is for their buyer so that they can provide the product that their buyer needs. And one of the things that we do in Idaho um, at the Barley Commission is we fund a significant amount of research, and part of that is through the university funding barley variety trials where all of these things are tracked at regions all around the state, and the same is happening in the other barley growing states. So we have ongoing agronomic research so that we can really help growers find the best practices and the varieties for what those purposes are. Thank you. Uh, you know when corn has a grain system, Wheat also has a grading system. For barley, do you have a growing a grading system, or you have to write down the the specification for the contract? Okay, another great question. So there is not like a national grading system that is adhered to because of the contracting and the specs that each company has are different. So. Um, Barley can be independently tested. The way it's happening now is most of the testing is done by the companies that are doing the contracting. They'll take samples out of each load and run it through their labs. Like at the schooler facility, um, they take samples out of the truck. They have the lab right there at the plant. They do the testing there. So it's um, not outside and separate but there is testing that goes on and you can get reports and information about 
quality, um, foreign material, all of those things that might be important for your uses, and you can work with your supplier on the information that you need and the specifications that are important for your end use. Any other questions? Again, if you'd like to talk about barley, come and see me. Um, think barley um, and think beyond beer because it does have a lot to offer for the uh, feed market. Thank you. Gracias a ti. Gracias. Well, thank you. Now we're going to begin our break. Uh, first uh, break, uh, again, we went over. Uh, we're a bit delayed, but the idea is to be back here at 10 a.m. But before we break for our break, I would like to give a round of applause to Rebecca and to Laura for their wonderful presentations. And I'll see you back at 10, okay?